I would like to celebrate with you all an anniversary. For it's exactly almost to the day, one year ago, that I committed one of the biggest failures of my life. You see, I dropped my daughter at an LA Dodger game to catch a baseball. <laughs> and I dropped the baseball. And it was all caught on film, and it ended up on the internet. <laughs> Epic fail. <laughs> so why am I bringing this up here at a TED conference in Edmonton, you might be asking? Because I believe something good can come out of this experience. And as I've healed from the shame, it has reaffirmed my faith in something I'd like to call the creative process. And I'd like to share that faith with all of you. You see, in my day job, when I'm not dropping children on the internet, I work in the movie business. More specifically, the cartoon movie business. I've been an animator, story artist, designer, director, writer for the last 15 years, and I've failed to become famous for anything except dropping a kid at a baseball game. <laughs> Now, I grew up loving baseball. It was a family sport, it was what we played. Even though I'm Canadian, that was the sport we had. Uh, But baseball never loved me. Um, I was a kid lacking self-confidence. I was small, wall-eyed, no depth perception, uh, absolutely 0% aptitude for any kind of athletics. You can call me a nerd, but I wasn't very smart either. Um, <laughs> it's kind of just a sitting duck for bullies and tormentors and jocks. But I learned how to survive at a very young age. I adopted a strategy of camouflage, fading into the woodwork of life choosing to observe rather than participate. Now, the positive side of this is I lived in my sketchbook, and that turned me into the art kid, which allowed me to be accepted by the jocks and the bullies, and high school wasn't that bad. The downside was I also became a card-carrying pessimist. When I wasn't in my sketchbook, I kind of believed that the worst-case scenario was the one that was going to happen, and I tried to avoid it by staying out of confrontation. So that day, at the Dodger game, I was just one of the crowd, sitting there with my kids, uh, watching the ball game. And my kids were having a very natural reaction to the sport of baseball that most children have. They were bored to death. <laughs> Everything was going fine in the seventh inning. We were rolling along when the whole thing changed. That's when I picked up my eight-year-old daughter to try to spark some excitement in the game. And that's when the story of baseball came at us in the form of a lob ball. Now, there are some people who handle uh, events of sudden action with grace and instinct. <laughs> oh, there's a ball coming at me. I shall reach out into the universe and retrieve that ball. Ha-ha, the world is safe. Pip, pip, jolly good. <laughs> I am not one of those people. My brain's a little bit more like a Muppet. <laughs> uh, what, what's that? It's a ball. It's coming at us. Ah! That's when I start to awkwardly tangent in violently contradictory directions in my attempt to both catch and flee from the ball. <laughs> kind of had the same experience with girls growing up. <laughs> so what I thought happened was I set my kid down and I reached out to catch the baseball. That's where my reality and real reality depart because apparently according to the footage, what happened is I dropped both. Um, now, my daughter was fine. She's eight years old. It wasn't the first time or the last time she's been dropped by her dad. I mean, <laughs> she's getting used to the disappointment. Um, and the ball, it just it bounced away, and someone else got it. No big deal. We settled back in to watch the rest of the game, completely oblivious to the ripple we just created in the universe. Now, this is very similar to the creative process. Because I had just created something, and it had come out of failure. I do this all the time, <laughs> but with cartoons. You see, making an animated film isn't rocket science. It's closer to watching a chimpanzee throw spaghetti on the wall. Sometimes something sticks, sometimes it doesn't. At work, we draw the movie. We draw our ideas out. Then we pitch the movie. Then we tear it apart. And when we have nothing left, we go back and redraw it again. And then we edit it, 
And then we tear it apart again. And then we redraw it again. And at the end of a very long day, maybe you have something that doesn't suck. It's an iterative process where an idea might survive because it makes someone laugh one day, and then the next day it's got to die because it's wrong for the story. It's a process where frustrated gamblers, otherwise known as studio executives, are pitted against passive-aggressive shut-ins, <laughs> creatures with the bodies of adults and the minds of children, with the social skills of a potato. <laughs> and while all this might make animation sound miserable, it's not. Because every now and then, something unexpected happens. A magical thing I like to call the click, when an idea suddenly falls into place. And to me, it's like the good part of childbirth, not the yelling and bleeding bit, but the glory of creation bit, when everything feels like it comes together. And the true challenge is letting the process happen. Having faith in the outcome and keeping your cynicism down so you can survive all the failure with an open enough mind that you can actually hear that click. It might be faint when it happens. We're like idea farmers. We plant seeds and we see what grows. We don't know what we're planting. It could be gold. It could be a dead tooth. Most often it's just corn. Doesn't matter. It's what the movie needs. That's what you're searching for. Whoop, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Now I know all this, and I've functioned for years in the randomness of being a story artist in Hollywood. I wasn't expecting anything to come out of the shenanigans of that night's ball game. I was wrong. And two days later on a Sunday evening, while working on my computer at home, I got a strange email from a friend in Minnesota with the uh, header attachment saying, is this you? Now I've come to learn over the last year that when I get an email that says, is this you, it's usually going to be bad news. Um, because opening the attachment, it was me at a baseball game dropping a child. <laughs> well, my brain went into denial. Hmm, Minnesota, that's weird. I mean, such a random event. I mean, how did this non-eventful event end up in Minnesota? <laughs> Thank goodness, I only know one person in Minnesota. <sighs> that went away when I got another email from Toronto and then one from Texas, these people don't know each other, then one from San Francisco, then one from London, England, and I suddenly realized I was in a deep puddle of crud. Because um, my little video had gone viral, and that's not as fun as it sounds. Um, by the time I went to bed that night, I'd seen it on the 10 o'clock news, on Sports Center. I had thousands of emails and phone calls and text messages and Facebook hits and, and, and tweets. Uh, I still managed to sleep like a baby that night. A baby with colic and a staph infection who lived under a railroad track. I was miserable because the internet was making fun of me. <laughs> the internet had taken my, my worst angst-ridden adolescent day of high school and flushed his head down the toilet because apparently it was now the internet's job to kick my arse. And it was in the wake of that next 24 hours where I committed the only mistake that I regret to this day. I completely shut down. I committed the cardinal sin of the creative process. I let my failure stop me instead of using it to grow. I gave up. I became a pile of blubbering man meat. My confidence completely shot. I started drinking at home, at work, in between. Uh, I dumped Facebook. I collapsed my blog. I left my cell phone under the bed. I stopped drawing. I actually staggered through my life with just a hollow shell of my former self. When some people get depressed, they grow beards. I shaved mine, and that really messed up my kids, because apparently this makes this look better. And because I believed in the words of a bunch of random opinionated folks out there in the internet, there's a lot of random opinionated folks on the internet. Did you know that? I actually fulfilled their definition of who I was. And I became a bad father, a bad husband, and a bad, clean-shaven human being. This went on for months. I was saved, though, by something I could have never expected to come to my defense. The very creative process that I had, that I had betrayed. 
I was at work and we were having a story session and we were struggling to find empathy for our main character in our story, which is a huge problem. We couldn't write the movie, we couldn't get into it, and we were banging our heads against the wall. When my co-director and my buddy turned to me and he said, you know, what if we put our character through an experience that one of us is having right now? Um, <laughs> <laughs> What if we take his self-confidence and we, we, we level it with a random incident of public humiliation and see what happens? Kapow! All of a sudden, I felt the Phoenician stirrings of a, of, of, of a new opportunity. It was a great idea. We could write it because I was living it! C click! And we did write it. We wrote it into the movie. It might not survive. Um, Oh, I'll leave that. It might not survive, but for the time, it gave us a real emotional connection to the story. And after months of self-destructive behavior, now I could see the light of positivity up ahead of me. And by turning my experience into a story, I was able to find meaning in the event. And I was able to accept the failure. And by accepting the failure, I was able to be normal again. And sobering up, I had to ask some really tough questions of myself. I mean, if I shut down so quickly in the face of something small and stupid like a viral internet video that defined nothing of my relationship to the people I love, how would I react in the face of real tragedy, of a loved one's death, of a war, of a tsunami? People go through this every day. It defines what it means to be human. Who do I want to be as a person? And I began to realize that my cynical outlook on life it wasn't working. It hadn't protected me from this failure. I hadn't seen it coming. And I couldn't retreat now that it was upon me. And even if I could run away, I realized that by sitting on the sidelines of life and judging without participating, I was as bad as those random people out on the internet who were judging me. And I didn't respect them, and I didn't respect myself. I'd always been a pessimist, but I no longer wanted to be. I wanted to change. And so I began to hunt for a new, optimistic way of looking at life. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but it's not. I didn't have to look very far. You know, as a filmmaker, I just had to look at our process. Um, I don't shy away from torturing the characters in my movies with failed hopes and dreams. Um, if a character had what they wanted at the beginning of a story, there'd be no reason to watch. I don't care what you're talking about. Rocky. Moses, young Skywalker, Homer, or Alice through the Looking Glass. These characters' successes would mean nothing if they weren't first defined by a handful of bad choices and failures. Come on. Um, they get down, but they never give up. And that's why we love them. And I could learn from that. So this experience was probably the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I faced one of my worst fears, public humiliation, and I survived. I'm doing it again right now! <laughs> I disconnected from the internet out of fear, but then I reconnected because I need people, and the risk is worth it if I'm going to be a writer. When I pulled back the veil from my cynicism, I realized that my, my kids still love me, and I still love my kids. You know, my friends are still my friends, my wife still puts up with me, and the strangers who I don't know, well, they're just strangers, and they don't matter. Optimism for me is a daily struggle, um, but I take a lot of solace in the words of Jim Booten, who was an ex-big league knuckleballer. He wrote in his book, uh, Ball Four, what separates professional athletes from other mere mortals? Well, in a tight situation, the amateur says to himself or herself, I failed in this situation, I'll probably fail again. Whereas the professional says and means it, I failed in this situation, and I've succeeded. And since each situation is a separate test of my abilities, there's no reason why I can't succeed today. That, to me, is practical optimism. And I've, it's become my new mantra. When I start to spin, I say it to myself, and it's helped me, whether I'm pitching to studio executives, speaking at a TED conference, or just trying to be a good dad. So looking at life as if it was a creative process, I think real truthful character moments, they come they don't come out of thin air. They're discovered in the wreckage of failure, comedy, drama, emotion. True originality isn't from writing, it's from rewriting. It's not the shot, it's the rebound, son. I truly believe in the optimistic opportunities of failure. Sucks when it happens. I wouldn't recommend seeking it out. But behind every original idea is a swath of benign failure, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. So... 
baseball isn't life, you know? But I like to think there's some metaphors there that we can use. You get three swings of the bat and at least nine innings to play. And the game isn't over until someone turns out the lights. You know, doesn't matter whether you win or lose. And at the end of the day, I think the only failure that really I can't live with is I got to try and at least catch that ball. So thank you all for listening. I hope you have a great day.